This morning we'll focus on the thromboembolic issues. Um, the first session you know, we'll start with pulmonary embolism, uh, which is more of a hospital-based issue, as most of us know. Um, and Dr. Uh, Serena Tumala, who's an interventional radiologist at University of Miami, is going to present that. The reason I have it here, even though a lot of us don't do this work, we need to know about it because uh, apparently all the, the meetings and things that I do, even hospitals with PERT teams, and if you don't know what a PERT team is, you'll hear a little bit about it, they're not getting the, the patients with submassive and massive PEs refer to them on time for treatment and the new treatments that are available. And in the venous space, there's really two life-threatening issues. One, and the main one is pulmonary embolism. And there are good treatments now if patients get treated on time. The other one's, you know, phlegmasia that I'll talk about in a second, which is less common. All right, Serini. All right, I want to welcome everybody. I want to thank uh, Jose for this uh, invitation and having uh, another great meeting and actually taking the plunge to have a hybrid meeting with people in person. I think uh, we're all kind of craving that with all these virtual talks and, and meetings that we've been having. So I'm going to make this real quick. I'm gonna, it's, it's really a brief overview. When I spoke to Jose about this, he wanted me to just give kind of a few basics, not get into a lot of detail, and then we're going to get into some cases which are not meant to be tricky, but more to kind of uh, really generate a discussion about you know, what devices, how somebody would approach this. And you'll see that different operators may use different uh, endovascular uh, devices that we have available right now. So obviously we know that over the past five years, you know, PE therapy has really progressed. Uh, you know, we've become much more aggressive in terms of our, of our therapies. Uh, there's really no clear consensus at this point. And, uh, you know, trying to figure out which, you know, mechanical uh, thromboembolectomy device you're going to use has, is really kind of the crux of the matter and has become quite difficult with all these newer devices that are hitting the market. So obviously, what can be done when you have somebody that has submassive PE or even massive PE? We've obviously got multiple options today. We've got anticoagulation. We've got systemic TPA. You know, if you remember the so-called 100 milligrams of IV TPA infused over a couple hours. You got catheter-directed thrombolysis. We've obviously got all the devices, the percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy devices that we have, which I'll go over real quickly. And of course, the, we still have surgical embolectomy, which is a good surgery and, and can be done quite quickly in uh, experienced hands. Obviously, you know, the first one that really hit the market where people were excited about was the Ecos uh, catheter. It's a five French catheter that has side holes on it so you can infuse TPA and at the same time it has an ultrasound fiber or core. So then you're basically giving these ultrasonic waves to really fragment thrombus to increase the surface area and allow that TPA to really work well. Um, we've got the Penumbra device now and they have a 12 French system called the Penumbra Lightning 12, and you can see here how it works. It's got some technology that allows it to basically shut off when it's in flowing blood, but obviously has very, very high pressure aspiration and can work uh, quite well in certain situations. And then we've got the Inari system, which has been around for a while now. It's obviously had multiple iterations. You've got uh, an aspiration catheter called the Trever 20, Trever 24. They typically, this goes through a 16 French sheath. And then obviously there's the, which, uh, and, and the catheter works primarily just like a penumbra. It's really aspiration, but instead of having a, a device or a machine, it's really done with manual, uh, with a syringe, and I'll show you that. And then obviously we've got the flow retriever catheter, which really has some cages or baskets, which you deploy in the clot. You can use it to macerate clot and kind of pull it into a system. And this is really what it looks like. So here's the manual aspiration component of the Inari flow retriever uh, system. It's basically like a suction thrombectomy, right, that we've done in the past without uh, any fancy devices. And then it gives you the catheter. Then you'll see next, you'll see the flow retriever uh, device, which is basically these cages or baskets which allow you to kind of engage clot, you know, similar to some of the devices we would use with stroke, mechanical thrombectomy and stroke uh, therapy. And you can see you can use it like this. You can pull it into the system 
and then you can also have a manual aspiration component. So you've got three devices really that can work. So why do we talk about mechanical thrombectomy? Why not TPA for anybody? Well, obviously not everybody is a TPA candidate. They might be, po a lot of PE is post-op. They've had major resections, whether it's in the brain, the belly, elsewhere. Obviously with these devices, we typically don't worry about intracranial hemorrhage or major bleeding. There's always the potential of injury, right, to the pulmonary artery or the heart, so you can have that as a problem. You can still use catheter-directed thrombolysis in certain instances if you need to. And, you know, think surgical embolectomy without the sternotomy. That's kind of the way I like to describe it. And you can get rapid cardiovascular improvement, obviously. But obviously, these, these devices are not perfect, right? They require some extra training, a little expertise. There's nuances to each of them. The devices are getting larger and bigger, and so there's more chance for iatrogenic injuries and uh, causing arrhythmias and so forth, whether it's the heart uh, or the access site or even the pulmonary artery. So what can we do? Well, we can do rock, paper, scissors and figure out which device we're going to use because there's not a lot of head-to-head -head comparisons of these devices in terms of should I use an Inari, a Penumbra, a, just a catheter and a syringe, or should I use an Ecos? Instead, we're going to go with a PERT team. And this is really something that I think is changing the landscape of PE, right? It's a multidisciplinary team, really where you bring together multi, multiple specialties, whether it's surgery, cardiology, radiology, anesthesia, pulmonary medicine and critical care, et cetera, to really talk about these. So just like you activate a STEMI team or a stroke team or a trauma team like we have as well, we activate the PERT team. And then everybody just talks about it because there's a lot of nuance to a lot of these patients and there's not a lot of strong data to kind of help us which way we got to go, especially in the setting of submassive PE. And that's the reason why you need a PERT team. The, nationally, you can think of this PERT consortium. You know, I'm not here to promote them, but I'm here just to tell you that there is a body that's trying to guide and influence PE care. They're trying to do research and come up with algorithms as best they can to figure out the best way and the best way to treat these, uh, these really difficult patients. So let's go into some cases, because I know that's what everybody wants to see and get into some discussion. Again, these are not meant to be tricky. It's more just to generate discussion and see what our operators uh, would do uh, with the same case. So obviously here's a 54-year-old gentleman, prior history of stroke, hypercoagulable condition, no prior DV, uh, DVT or PE in the past, obviously presents with dyspnea for about three days, really hemodynamically stable, maybe a little tacky, but you know, blood pressure is, is okay in the 120s, uh, systolic. Uh, PECT shows really uh, bilateral PE, and patients got strain on echo, CT, cardiac enzymes, troponin, BNP, et cetera, are elevated. This is the pre-CT, and if you look on the image on the left, you'll see there's really near occlusive or partially occlusive thrombus in the, in, the, in the right PA distally as well as the left PA. No real central clot. Uh, you can see here that there's clearly uh, right ventricular dilatation. There's flattening of the interventricular septum. There's an abnormal RVLV ratio. You've got the echo, which you know my cardiology colleagues would be able to tell you better than I can, but it really, when I talk to them, shows RV dilation and hypokinesis. So really, we've got all the things we're worried about in a patient, in this case, who has submassive PE. And so now we have some time to activate the PERT team. So how would you guys treat this? Um, Let's try the mouse so the zoom people can see the aerial coming up. Okay. Is the aerial coming up? Or? Yeah, let me see here. Yeah, I'm not, not really getting a mouse, but most of the other ones I think will be pretty obvious, uh, hopefully. So hopefully everybody can see this. Um, how about, uh, you know, Tino, I know, you know, you guys have a, a PERT team and a pretty robust PE practice. Um, there's obviously multiple ways to treat this. We're dealing with submassive PE. What are you looking at or what types of things are, are helping you decide what device to use? someone who had a history of a stroke, so you kind of think twice about whether you want to give IV TPA. You may get away with using um, some catheter directed TPA because it's much less, and you know the bleeding risk is less. Um, you show some, you know, hematologic, you know, some dynamic evidence that the patient had some, like you said, some uh, submassive or some kind of right large strain. So I think this would be an interesting case to try to Either, you, know, you, you could either do some uh, catheter-directed lysis good. to basically oh. try to relieve that pressure in the heart. 
So, you know, you, you've talked about two devices, a penumbra device, an RE device, and even you could, uh, an, an, an ECOS catheter, you know, there's data for all three of them. There's probably the most data for the ECOS device, but all those are things that you can do. Okay, and I'll tell you the stroke was remote maybe about a year ago. Um, yeah. Lowell? Th this uh, field, um, how do you decide what device you're going to use, and is there any support for the device that you use? I, I think that's what we're, we're kind of grappling with, right? That when to use certain devices. I mean, some people will try to categorize it morphologically or structurally, you know, is the clot central? Is there a large clot burden? Do I need a large device to remove it? Or is it more peripheral? Is it subsegmental, et cetera? So it, there's a lot of stuff here that we just don't know. I wanted to see if Tim, uh, if he can hear us, uh, what his thoughts are and how he would approach this case as well. Uh, yeah, this is Tim. Uh, the, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I, I don't uh, do a lot of percutaneous uh, uh, PE, PE lysis or thrombectomy, but I work closely with our interventional colleagues, uh, John Kaufman and uh, uh, Ramsey Al-Hakim, and uh, they tend to ha uh, have favor the um, ECOS catheter quite a bit uh, when that cannot be used uh, because of bleeding concerns, then they tend to use the penumbra, I believe. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and really our algorithm has been kind of similar in the sense of we thought this patient could handle TPA. We, didn't, we weren't concerned about this uh, past history of stroke at the time. We actually had our neurology colleagues sign off on it acutely as well, just to, to give some level of, of comfort and confirmation. We thought the PE was relatively peripheral. Uh, there was no saddle embolus. It wasn't central. We knew we had some time to treat. Here's the initial pulmonary arteriogram, the right and left sides. And if you've never looked at these, what I want you to notice is that there's not a lot of peripheral vasculature filling, right? Mm. You're filling mostly central pulmonary, you know, the kind of the main stems of each side, but you're not getting a lot of peripheral. And when I show you the final, I think you'll see the difference. We opted actually for ECOS in this, ca in this case, and, and, and we decided to do ECOS because we thought it was, you know, minimally invasive in the sense of it's not a huge device. Putting in five French catheters, here are the catheters in place. You can do a two hour, four hour, six hour, et cetera. We use a, a 12 hour infusion of one milligram of TPA on each side. And then we used to bring them down for arteriograms as I'll show you in this case as an example, but we don't anymore. We basically just monitor uh, the PA pressures and we monitor uh, with echo. And once things normalize and the patient uh, symptomatically is, is better, then we basically pull the catheters on the floor. So you don't have to bring them back like you used to. So now I want you to look at the top images or the pre and the bottom images of the post. And I think you can see there's a big difference in terms of how well the peripheral pulmonary artery vasculature is filling. And so again, you know, we're not looking for a perfect fix or an, uh, you know, a pretty result here. We're looking for hemodynamic improvement, symptomatic improvement. And I think that's what you really have to realize when you're de dealing with uh, PE cases, is that it's not how much clot you pull out, it's what the hemodynamics and how the patient is doing. And you can see on follow-up here on the left is the initial. You can see the RV is dilated. There's some flattening of the septum. On the, on the right, uh, things are improved. You can see the left ventricle is larger because now it can actually fill with blood. I think if you look at the orange arrow, I'm trying to show you that the clot has cleared, as we would expect with a 12-hour TPA infusion. Luckily, most of this clot was acute and subacute and not chronic. And then the patient uh, went on to do well and was discharged, obviously, on anticoagulation. So let's go to the next case. Uh, it's a 58-year-old uh, female with chest pain, shortness of breath, tachycardia, all the classic signs of, of, of really PE. Had COVID-19 for several weeks, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and had a recent uh, meningioma resection, so a benign tumor resection, so uh, about six months ago. So obviously, we're, we're more concerned about using uh, long-term uh, TPA. Um, heart rate here, the vitals. So again, it's not somebody with hemodynamic collapse, so we're not dealing with massive PE. We're dealing with someone who's in the submassive category. They obviously had right heart strain, you know, for anybody that does this, there's PESI scores to kind of give you an idea of mortality, et cetera. All the typical enzymes were elevated. And uh, here's what it looked like on the PECT chest. And uh, hopefully you can see that. My mouse is not working, but if you look on the left side of each image, you can see there's kind of that dark clot in the left pulmonary artery. And so 
uh, how would you guys treat this one? Um, maybe I'll, I'll bug Tino. Yeah, you know, I think this is a great case because as opposed to the first one, this one's a little bit more disturbing, right? So you see the patient who I, when I would see these numbers, I, you know, I haven't, we're not seeing the patient, we're looking at the patient's numbers, I, I'm a little bit concerned. I, I can see they're tacky to 150. Uh, O2SAT is 94%. I'm assuming they've probably already started some anticoagulation. Um, and you know, this person to me is getting to the point where they can, they can collapse on you pretty quickly. And uh, so this is someone that I may want to try to get in and treat them a little bit quicker, right? So the ECOS catheter is going to take 12 hours or so to get some effect. Um, and you know, you're, you're basically uh, opening in this one. I'm like, I want to get in and get, you know, th this patient uh, is kind of on the borderline as to they, they may dip over to become really unstable. So this is, and we already know with the right heart, you know, if, you, if these people get intubated and this and that, they don't do well because, you know, you, re you reduce their peripheral resistance and it just floods, you know, the, the right heart gets, it gets even worse. So um, this type of patient, I think. I'm looking at the tachypnea, respiratory rate yeah, 30. Respiratory you rate can only 30. maintain this, that this, for an these hour people, or two. Yeah. This is someone that I want to get in and go for some kind of the mechanical thrombectomy to try to relieve some of that pressure as soon as I can and try to get some, some relief. And I think, you know, we have the, um, obviously we talked about the penumbra, the, the CAT-12, or the Inari device, the T24, to get in and try to relieve some of that clot. Yeah. Tim, do you want to weigh in? I know you said you don't do lots of these, but you're obviously uh, involved. What, what are your thoughts uh, just on the numbers, on the overall patient situation? Yeah, it's a fine balance, you know, the uh, bet uh, between uh, the patient who is uh, submassive and doing okay, and they will, you know, long term not have a uh, right heart failure uh, in the long term uh, versus the ones who have cardiovascular collapse. So it's kind of tricky uh, to um, to identify those patients. This one looks like a little bit more straightforward. If this patient doesn't um, have any significant improvement within you know a fairly short period of time with uh, fluid resuscitation and aggressive anticoagulation. This prob this prob patient would probably be uh, uh, going to the IR suite and having uh, debulking, as Tino said, uh, with uh, uh, the angiojet or the uh, penumbra. So, so Serini, one yeah. thing that we haven't touched on is, is chronic pulmonary hypertension in these folks afterwards. So is 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 that uh, governed by thrombus burden and how much you can get out or, or what, uh, who goes on to develop chronic pulmonary hypertension? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we're still figuring out. I mean, I'll let Lowell and Tino and everybody weigh in, but, you know, CTEF, what they, you know, what we're talking about, you know, the development of chronic pulmonary artery hypertension with time is something we worry about, just like you think about PTS, you know, in the, uh, in the legs. So, it's something we do worry about. It's something we don't know a lot about, and we, and we definitely and then, want to clear. And then, Tim, there's a growing surgical option for chronic pulmonary hypertension, as you know, which is cardiac surgery and doing an actual open thrombectomy. Yep. And I'm hearing of more centers, especially San Diego and a couple of places, Mass General, doing this. Have you had experience, and do you guys think it works, or how, how does that work out? You're on mute. Oh, sorry. The, uh, there have been very selective cases of open surgical thrombectomy. Our cardiothoracic surgery colleagues uh, will do it. Uh, uh, it's, uh, again, the issue of identifying the right patient uh, who is not going to be so sick that, the, that they're irretrievable, but not doing it unnecessarily. So, I mean, I have been involved in a few cases, um, and uh, it's usually in collaboration with the IR people who... Uh, you know, they may have tried to do a debulking, it, it didn't work, or there was a complication. I presented a case at um, uh, IVC just, uh, uh, I think, several years ago about a patient who had a complication from the uh, angiojet and then had to go uh, undergo uh, surgical thrombectomy as well as repair of the pulmonary artery. So yeah, yes, uh, it, it, it's a it's a rare situation, but here at our institution, but uh, they will definitely do it. Yeah. All right. So let's get so back to the yeah. A, well, just yeah. an interruption. Yeah, this patient seems uh, to be eminent for uh, collapse, and the question is, when the PERT team gets called, uh, how long does it take in in your situation to activate that and get that patient to lab or wherever you're going to treat 
Yeah, so the way that PERT teams activate our place is similar to a STEMI, a stroke, uh, or a trauma. It's a global page that goes out to everybody and it keeps paging until everybody dials in. So usually most people are, are signed in or are called on, you know, in within, within five to 15 minutes, very quickly. Yep, so I'm gonna, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, you have a question. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, I don't see a button on here, but um, what about, um, six months out, like the prognosis for that. Let's say we don't do something. How would you manage them? Would you follow them with a VQ scan in six months? And what would be uh, your strategy? Um, we have our, you, you wanna take that, Tina? Yeah, our I think it's a great question. And I think it's not only if you treat them or if you don't treat them, I think all these patients need some kind of follow up. So a lot of times um, we'll, I will follow them in 30 days in the office and really get an idea of how they're doing. Are they back to their, are they back to all their activities of daily living? Are they walking, are they, do they get short of breath, this and that? Because I want to see if there's any of this pulmonary hypertension, anything that, that is coming out. Because those are the people that at 30 days, you can already start, hopefully start getting them into treatment. So we've talked about pulmonary embolectomy, something that would may usually occur not in the acute setting, but a little afterwards. And now there's a lot of centers that actually will go in and dilate the pulmonary arteries if they, we find these webs and synechiae. And that's something also that's developing in a, in a lot of centers. But I think you're right, the follow-up of these patients is very important. You're gonna get them through this acute phase, and then you follow so, them. So Tino, they come in at three months, and they're short of, you know, they're having, the, the, their exercise capacity is not what it was. What do you do exactly? So at that point, we, you know, basically, you know, you get them in the you know, pulmonary hypertension, um, you know, doctor. We basically, we have a, a so physician team, a pulmonologist and, and cardiologist are, now. That and deal. what do they do? And you know, they'll follow the patient. They can give them vasodilators, peripheral vasodilators. But at the end, a lot of these patients may require uh, a little bit more, like we said, those interventions. And you know, right now there's centers that are specializing in doing those. It's a technique that really has, uh, became very popular, I think, in Japan. There's a lot of experience. So there's people in the U.S. have gone and actually trained in Japan and doing them. So again, hope, the goal is not to, to prevent that patient from getting there, right? That's why we're having these teams. That's why we're trying, you know, we want, the first goal is to prevent death. We know there's a huge amount of death in these patients that have massive or submassive PE. Identify the ones that are gonna get worse, see if we can treat them, avoid them from dying. And then the second point is can you avoid them from having this, you know, you know becoming a pulmonary cripple from having this debilitating post care. And then that I think involves also with early treatment and if we don't have the early treatment, or maybe the early treatment got them out of the death range, but they still have some residual pulmonary hypertension that they develop, then how do you treat them from there? So you're right, the, I think the response team is important, but then you need to have the back end of how, how you're gonna treat them. Yeah. So and what's I, and I, acceptable for you all to clear the thrombus or embolus from? Um, like the uh, end point? Uh, yeah, what, table, is, end what point. is your end point? Yeah. And yeah. How critical is it? Yeah. Is it just to save the life? And, yeah. Because the lung does have its what own I'll, elements of TPA. I think what I'll do, Lowell, is let me finish this case. The third case gets into okay. your question, actually, pretty well. It's a great question. So I think it just shows you how much we don't know at this point in terms of you know, the prognosis of these patients, Same. even after thrombectomy, when you're talking about developing pulmonary hypertension. So in this case, we, we thought the same thing uh, as well, that the team thought that this patient, although they were in the submassive category, that they were kind of on the border and could convert to a massive PE and, and be a significant problem for us. So we decided to take this patient to the uh, angio suite and um, um, performed an, angio, uh, an arteriogram. We thought most of the clot burden was on the left side. As you can see, there's a filling defect in that main left pulmonary artery. So there's a pretty big chunk of, of thrombus in there, whether it's acute, subacute, chronic, or all three. Uh, we opted for the Penumbra device or the Lot Lightning 12 device in this case. Uh, and basically you can see it's kind of a back and forth movement. It has a separator or a wire you can, or a kind of a, a guide wire you know, called a SEP12 you can put in there to kind of macerate and pull a clot into the system. And then you're basically doing really um, high pressure aspiration here. And then uh, you can see there's some clot that's removed. Um, and then you can see the difference now. I, hopefully you can see on the left, that's the, the filling defect, looks like toothpaste in that main left pulmonary artery. And you can see now it's all black, it's clean for those of you that don't see these things often and so we've cleared it out. Uh, you can see here's the pre and post. I think now you can see the clots removed. Um, another picture of the same thing. 
and then you can see that the PA pressures didn't really change much, right? 31 to 28, blood loss was about 70 cc's, but the patient on the table uh, symptomatically improved significantly. And this gets into what Lowell's talking about. What is the end point when you're doing these cases? Are you trying to remove a certain volume of clot? Are you looking for a pretty angiographic picture? Are you looking for an improvement in the PA pressure? Uh, because, you know, a lot of people we talk about, you may not see a significant difference in the PA pressure, and I'd, I'd like to hear, you know, Tim and Tino's uh, opinion on this as well, is that, you know, they talk about the myocardium is stunned, right? It's ischemic. That's why the enzymes are elevated and abnormal. And so what ends up happening is that even though you've removed a significant amount of clot, the, the heart doesn't react or respond as quickly as you'd expect. Sometimes it can take 24 hours. And so what we do is we basically go with symptoms. Is the respiratory rate better? Is the O2 saturation better? Are they oxygenated? But do they subjectively feel better? Um, and uh, how are they doing clinically? That's really been our biggest determinant. And, and obviously, if we've you know done several maneuvers and pulled out a large volume of clot, everything looks better. Then we'll stop. That's kind of Tino. Uh, what are you, what are your thoughts on how you guys your endpoints? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you know having the, the fact that it cleared is always nice. A lot of times you may not see those changes as, as obvious as in the case you showed, but you really what you're trying to get in there, a lot of times in the central PE, try to aspirate and get as much as you can out. Uh, you know, the, I think you know, going into the branches sometimes is important. If you have patients that have a lot of distal thrombi and being able to get either a catheter or something, how we able to get that out? And you, you mentioned the separator. A lot of times you can do that very good. soft wire. You can get out in these different areas. Um, sometimes you have a bigger catheter in the main PA and then Great. go with a smaller catheter Great. so you can do that oh, thanks, with thanks. either type of device. But, but, but I think the important thing here is that you're, you're going to try to get as much clot out and then you're going to follow that patient closely. Yeah. And you know, I, I think there's a small percentage of patients that we have to retreat, but you, you really want to make sure you, you have your antenna up. And there's nothing wrong, I think, that, hey, somehow you know, this patient we need to go back and treat. And, and you, you want to get them in that acute phase. Let me ask one quick thing. So say they're, they're uh, submassive, they're on the way to the lab, they get to the lab, you're plugged in, they get better on the table with anticoagulation. You put your devices in, you shoot a pulmonary angiogram, and it's just little thrombus out in the periphery. And hemodynamically, they were better than from the emergency room to now. Do you go after that stuff? Do you leave them alone and, and go? No, I think if they're, if they're that much better, what you're implying is they've kind of almost normalized, yeah. at least in terms yeah. of their, we would. But you still see thrombus. We wouldn't do anything, if, especially right. if it's peripherally located. We'd say, you know, anticoagulate. The risk benefit changes. of going after it, yeah. injury. Versus this injury to the heart, the cord of tendine, the The, the bowel, enemy of everything. good is better. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so we have about a minute, 40 seconds here. I'm going to go fast through this last case but still engage our panelists here. It's a 54-year-old gentleman with the usual symptoms, um, had a TIA about three months ago, history of a gastric ulcer six years ago, so not, nothing recent, uh, nothing active at this time. Um, presented really with this CT scan, and, and hopefully you know, my, my, my mouse doesn't work, but I'll tell you that they have saddle embolus, so clot involving the distal main pulmonary artery extending into both the right and left uh, uh, PAs. And uh, they've got a dilated right ventricle, uh, abnormal RV-LV ratio. So all the classic stuff, elevated enzymes, right ventricular strain on echo, and so forth. So how would you treat this one? Again, it's submassive. Um, their vitals were similar to the last patient. They're, they're, they're submassive, but they're kind of teetering a little bit. But uh, would you do ECOS? Would you do penumbra? Would you do um, Inari? Doesn't matter. We obviously don't have data where they're, in terms of head-to-head -head comparisons. So we can't really you know, say one device is better than the next, but we can say that they all work and, and are safe uh, in, in experienced hands. Uh, Tim, Tino, anybody? Lowell? What device uh, would you use? Easy. This is easy. Tim. I think, uh, generally speaking, when uh, there is time for lysis, uh, I think the ECOS is what our IR uh, colleagues go to. Um, the in, I think it uh, depends on the uh, physiologic parameters on the patient. If if the patient's doing okay, then I think they would uh, try to do that 12 hours. Tino. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of ways you can, you know, skin the cat here. 
but I think in central, you can go with something bigger. I mean, you, you could, I think all three devices are in play. If you want to get that caught out of there, you may go with something larger, you know, like a 24, you know, French Inari, you'll be able to kind of get all that out. You probably will be able to get most of that out also with, with a, um, an Indigo and a Cat 12. I think if you lice, you probably also will, will resolve that over time. And, and I think, you know, everything's uh, available for you. And I think it's important, you know, what we're trying to learn here is, are certain devices better for certain situations? And like you said, there's no head-to-head -head right. trials yet. You know, we say, you know, is the Corlat, it's more peripheral, do we need to lice those? Or do we need to go after them with a smaller device? If it's central, do we go with a bigger device? It's like, I, I don't think we know those answers. Correct. But I think that that's really where we try to gauge and, you know, like, like everything we do, where do we think we're gonna have our best shot with the, to treat it? And, and I think that will hopefully come out in the next couple of years. No, I think that makes good sense. So obviously I think here we've got time. You could use catheter-directed thrombolysis, whether it's ECOS or no ECOS. You can obviously use one of the devices. Our algorithm has been that when we have saddle embolus or large central uh, clot burden like this, that we tend to go with one of the thrombectomy devices uh, if we're able to. And we thought with the recent TIA that it was, we wanted to avoid TPA. And the red circles, I'm trying to show you that there's hypoperfusion. There's not much perfusion. Uh, to the lungs in those areas. I think you know most people can see that whether you look at these or not. Um, and we decided to go with the Inari system in this case. So we use the Trever 20, the Trever 24, take your pick. It goes through a, uh, I believe, a 16 French sheath uh, Tino, I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, up, up, to, a lot of times 24. So you're 24, 24. Yeah, 24 French sheath, yeah. Nice. And so we use that here, and you can see how big and bulky this device is. This is why, you know, even though we think it's, it's a great device to use, it's also not without its issues, right? It's a huge device you're trying to track through the heart across valves and get them to, and you want it to mm. take turns, so it's, it's not easy. And so we did that for both sides. You can see the- Lunderquist wire, big support wire. Yeah, right, yes, right, yeah. super stiff Amplats, yeah. Lunderquist, you know, there's a Meyer wire, you know, all these we use basically. And I think you can see that after a couple of, uh, you know, manual aspirations, we're able to get enough clot out to get some perfusion. You can see again the other side what we, uh, that we were doing manual aspiration, it didn't work. We ended up deploying the flow retriever device, those cages or baskets within the clot, and then we pulled it into the system, and then we were able to get uh, you know, a significant amount of clot out. Again, how much clot is the right amount, we don't know, but symptomatically and angiographically, the patient was doing better. You can see this left pulmonary arteriogram is not perfect. There's still a lot of clot left. There's not a lot of perfusion distally for those that don't, you know, look at these. And so, but again, the patient was symptomatically better, felt better subjectively. The numbers were better. Heart rate, uh, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, uh, et cetera, uh, and so forth. And then you can see there's a significant reduction on the CT the next day. You can see there's a, a big difference in the dilation of the right ventricle. The strain is gone on echo, significant resolution of the clot that we pulled out. Still a lot of clot burden, but much better than before. You can see on that lower image on the left, that's a, the clot. On the right, there's a little bit left, but again, we're not going for a pretty picture. We're just trying to make the patient bigger, uh, better and uh, prevent them from getting, uh, from dying, basically. So, uh, so that's the last so thing. This, let me just one last thing uh, for Tino. Uh, excellent images, excellent presentation on, on PE. Uh, so I'm seeing some parallels of, you know, uh, post, let's call it post-thrombotic syndrome of the lung, right? Chronic, chronic pulmonary hypertension is post-thrombotic syndrome of the lung, and we deal with post-thrombotic syndrome of the legs a lot. Um, we have, are going towards one and done when we can with procedures, and if, if it doesn't work, then maybe go on to something more extended. I see that theme here too. But the question is, how many of these in your practice, or is this an ongoing, where say they come back at three months with symptoms, would you go in and do an angioplasty of uh, some stenotic segments of the pulmonary artery? Yeah, I think, you know, like Tino, uh, you know, described earlier, we are really refer, uh, reserving that for CTEF. So somebody that comes in, you know, six, nine, 12 months later is not getting better on conservative management, you know, meaning so being treated a by a, a pulmonary medicine doctor and cardiologist, and they're like, look, we have no other options. We've tried milronin, we've tried, you know, sent, you know, all these different medications, they're not improving. 
uh, we need to be more aggressive, then we'll, we'll do it. But again, it's awfully And then what do you actually do if they come back to you? What do you actually do? What is the intervention? Just put a, a regular well, balloon up there and stress Assuming that they have, you're basically would, just trying to improve. Would you ever stent the pulmonary artery? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, we do it so rare. We've done a couple of angioplasties, okay. but we're not trying, a common thing. Not yeah, that common. Okay. It's very a Any experience you can ask that, Tino. Tino yeah, we, we haven't had it. I think we've done one. It's not really an area that and a lot of those, you know, you still refer to place, you know, people that are, are picking up that experience. And, and Tim, the pulmonary arteries are very delicate. And, and very Tim, you guys do anything like that? Follow up? Uh... Not that I know of. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Reed. Thanks. That was thanks. great. Uh -huh.